this, this has been a fabulous year for, for the Central Coast chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum, uh, due in large part to uh, great, great participation uh, by our sponsors. So I'd like to have all of our sponsors please stand right now. Come on, don't be shy. I always forget to acknowledge Dave Cronin. Dave Cronin, sponsor. Uh, before we get into the uh, the main event tonight, I wanted to uh, just highlight uh, what's going to happen uh, in next month, May 21st. Uh, we have a, a program on uh, virtual reality, and actually our keynote speaker for next uh, month is here with us, Peter Schlur. Did I do that well? Where'd you go, Peter? There he is. So you'll see him next month, uh, virtual reality, uh, the next uh, Oculus, perhaps. Um, with that, I'll get on to the main event here. I will turn the, uh, the podium over to um, Guy Smith, a uh, long-serving board member and uh, chair of the uh, uh, Bachelor of Arts program at Antioch University, who will be our moderator tonight. Hold the applause. Uh, well, welcome and thanks for coming. I think that you're in for a real treat. And uh, we have uh, uh, Doc Searles, who you've read his bio, I'm sure. So that's, uh, you know, you might want to write this down now or take note of it now, because uh, Doc does have a slideshow. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Doc Searles. There's an old saying that says, uh, no man is a prophet in his own land. And uh, I'm going to prove that wrong tonight because not only is uh, Doc Searles a prophet, he's a visionary, and this is his own land. Um, because Doc maintains a primary residence in Santa Barbara, but he spends much of his time on the East Coast at uh, both Harvard, where he was a fellow at the Bergman Center for Internet and Society, and now a visiting scholar at NYU. Uh, he frequently speaks at major industry trade shows and has been I love this quote, holding forth on stuff <laughs> since 1988. He is, without doubt, one of the most informative and knowledgeable people about the internet, its past and future, and the opportunities and threats it presents. He is a author of a best-selling book, The Clue Chain Manifesto, as well as The Attention Economy. He's the director of the Project VRM at Harvard's Berkman Center, a fellow for UCSB's Center for Information Technology and Society, and he is a visiting scholar at the Graduate School of Journalism at NYU, a senior editor of Linux Journal, and one of the world's most quoted bloggers. And I believe this uh, paragraph really says it all. He is obsessed with a number of other topics, including geography, geology, aviation, space, media, infrastructure, and understanding how things work, especially the internet. So uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Doc Searles. Some of you have phones, and some of the phones will work in here. I don't think there's actually any internet here uh, otherwise. In any case, so the title of the talk is Reality Check, um, what you wish you'd known five years from now. You will have known five years from now. And, and uh, a, a way of looking at this is just what's the infrastructure we're sitting on right now? Like if, we're, if we're looking to take a deep look at what we're dealing with now, what is that? Well, the popular view of that is this. I mean, there's the big companies, Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple, that are fighting over the Internet. Who's going to win? And as a journalist, I can tell you these are the easiest stories in the world to write. Anything that's a sports or a war story just about writes itself. There's a box of words, you bring them out, you talk about the struggle, you bring in your football, or your baseball, or other metaphors, and it kind of writes itself. But in some ways, this is not an oversimplification because the infrastructures that we're using today are very much in these companies. If we're doing retailing, there's Amazon. If you're doing social networking, there's basically Facebook and Twitter, and that's about it. They own these spaces to a large degree. And, and if, um, if you're using the internet, of course, Google is basically the front page to the web today. Google's the first place you stop to find out everything. So what's behind that? If you actually look at the physical infrastructure, it's sort of interesting. Um, these things look like power plants. 
You know, now, an interesting comparison we could take here is that power plants and sewage systems and anything that's a utility, and these things qualify as utilities, tend to have degreed professionals that are, work for the government that come out and inspect them and know what's going on in there. If, you're, if you have a dam or you have a power plant or you're, you know, or you're running wastewater treatment or something, everybody knows what's going, what, what those do. We don't know what goes on in here. <laughs> for the most part. One of these is Microsoft's, that's the top right. Google's one in Finland is over here. That's Facebook's, and there's Facebook's being made up there. Um, <clears throat> now, an interesting thing, the, four, the fifth one in the middle is actually Google. It's one of their many publicity photos showing off what they're doing. Every data center kind of looks the same. They have Google colors reflecting off of their, their things there. But I was fascinated by this shot because it actually bore a resemblance to something else. I, it, I've, I looked at this and I thought, We've seen this movie before. It's called The Matrix, right? Look at this, this, is, this what's the difference? There's like none. There's like three guys in this one. You know, there's one guy in the other one. But, but this is what's happened. Our lives are inside here. Okay, Google is watching us at all times. And they're being envied by the other companies that also want to watch us at all times. Facebook wants to watch us at all times so they can better advertise at us and give us a better advertising experience as if that's all we're ever going to do. And, and this, is, this is so normative at this point. But being okay with being, for having much of our lives living inside these systems that we've actually reached what I call peak surveillance. This is, this is where we are right now. We're at peak surveillance. And it, it really hit peak last year with with uh, Edward Snowden's revelations because we found out the NSA could tap into this. Of course, Google was terribly outraged, but they were just copying what Google already does, okay? And they wanted to get in on that thing. So that's sort of the peak time. And this is from uh, the, um, uh, the New Yorker like several weeks ago. Get, get me everything on everybody. It's conceivable, right? This is conceivable, but it's also sort of at variance with what our human experience is and ought to be. So, but it's become so pervasive that even if you go to your bank, so our bank is Chase, here's Chase, right? This almost works. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Don't you know these things always fail at times like this? So fortunately there's a backup system. I can just walk over here and do that. So, but this is Chase, Chase is our bank. And, um, and I run something that's a, a, an add-on on, on Firefox. It's an extension on Google and others called Ghostery. It's one of many different add-ons you can get for your, for your browser that lets you see what spying is going on at that time. Right? And, so, and you can also cross some of them out. Axiom is on only because they're new. And, and I've actually consulted Axiom before. There may be some more backstory on that. But the interesting thing there is that you know, banking is a kind of a private thing to do. And, I mean, this is just their front page, and it's as far as I got with it. But Joyce, actually, who does our banking, showed me that if you click on here and you go to look at your, your statement, you're still looking at this. They are giving away information about you while you're looking at this most private part of your life, which is your statement, on, uh, your, your, your banking statement. This is not okay. This is not an okay thing to do, and yet it's normative. Nobody's questioning this. Well, actually, a lot of people are questioning it, me, for example. But it's, it's so normative at this point that we just sort of take it for granted that this is going on. But there are vulnerabilities to, to this. There are huge vulnerabilities. One, for example, we can see here with, with Target. You know, how many people here had to change their credit cards because of this thing? I, th I thought there'd be more than that. But, but you know, 110 million people 110 million credit cards had to get changed because of, this, because of this breach at one company, because all of this data was concentrated in one place. And the concentration of data is, in, is inherently a problem that we're finding more and more about as we go on. So here's another one, which is Ad Week, just uh, last October. Online ad fraudsters are stealing six billion from brands Security firm White Ops claims one in six PCs. We know the guys at White Ops. The guy running it, is, his name is Michael Tiffany. He calls himself a gentleman hacker. He's a high school dropout from Sacramento. He's a, a boy and now an adult genius. And he's figured out that right now, he actually said this is a low number. He actually spoke at an event right after I did, and he told me that the numbers are much higher. As many as 90% of the browsers operating in the world right now are busy clicking on ads on sites without you even knowing about it. 
there's a good chance your PCs are doing this. No virus protection is going to save you from this. It is more or less harmless to your computer, but it's an economic benefit for the Russian hackers and others that have created the systems that do nothing but game Google's and Yahoo's and other large companies' advertising systems. That's what's going on. There are entire buildings of people in India, for example, that are, do, nothing, do nothing but are paid to like stuff and to click on stuff in order to make money for people who are not actually adding anything of substance to the economy. Now, the rationalization for this is, well, you know what? It supports all kinds of other stuff. It's really, it's really, we can live with it because that, what harm is there really? And, and you know, it gives us the internet that we have today. But for the people collecting the data, it is remarkably bad much of the time. So for example, here's, um, Here's something from a company called Rapleaf. After the Wall Street Journal pulled their pants down a few, several years ago and said uh, what they were doing for collecting people's data, they said, okay, we'll let you come in here and remove anything that, that is wrong about, about you. Now, this is like two years ago here in Santa Barbara. Let me see if this works now by any chance. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, leave it to you. Joyce is going to take the battery out and put it back in again and see if it works. So, so I looked at this, and here's an interesting thing. You know, I didn't go to graduate school. They actually had my estimated income wrong. Um, I own a house. Well, that's revealing, right? You know, I have an influencer score. Who even knows what that is? We have a child in a household, more or less. He's away at boarding school. But most of the stuff is wrong. I, don't li I haven't lived at 94062 since 19, I say 2001. Most of this stuff is misleading. An interesting thing, too, is if I click remove on any of these and I go back in two weeks, it's back up again. So it's an absolutely useless thing to even look at. And yet, that's, that's you know, there, there's a business in that. But the market is actually speaking back, and it's speaking back in a kind of a mute way with ad blocking. So this is a company called Playfair, Pagefair rather. Pagefair has looked at the ad blocking rate in 2013, now almost 23%, and they're just projecting it up until it's a certain point, everybody is doing so much prophylaxis against advertising and tracking and the rest of it on their browsers that basically that entire business becomes useless at a certain point. Now that may be an exaggeration, they're doing a linear regression to, to, the, to the max, but still a linear progression rather. Um, that that's, that, that's, the, that's something that's the, that the market is saying to us right now. Julia Angwin, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, wrote for the Wall Street Journal, ran their What They Know um, series from 2010 to 2012, just came out with this book, Dragnet Nation, A Quest for Privacy, Security, and Freedom in a World of Relentless Surveillance. And interestingly, it's, it's all about what you can do to prevent anybody from spying on you. And it includes things like putting your phone inside what's called a Faraday bag. So, so, so you can't let the waves escape that are telling you know, the, the trackers what you're doing. It also eliminates a whole lot of convenience at the same time. But she actually, before she did that, she wrapped her phone in tinfoil. But the reason she did that was because at the Wall Street Journal, she did so much research on it that she had no, she was willing to trade away the conveniences of having her GPS report to Google where she was for the inconvenience of not having that because she knew at least I'm not being tracked by people and systems that I don't know. So what we're dealing with here today, right, is, is, a, is, a, is a circumstance where we essentially have no sovereignty. We have no sovereignty. You don't exist as an independent entity yet on the internet. It's a really weird irony, but there it is. And I'll go a little bit into what I mean by sovereignty in a few minutes when I talk about what the solutions are. But an interesting thing about the success of all these big companies is that all the little companies want to do the same thing to some degree. And not just like being in the advertising business, it's like the whole app marketplace, and a lot of us here make money in the app marketplace. I've encouraged the app marketplace in a lot of ways. There are now a billion apps according to Apple, I think it is. Different apps, like 900,000 on Android at this point. All, all of them just in many ways, for all the conveniences we get out of them, introduce some other inconveniences. So for example, if you want to do quantified self stuff where you're looking at your health data or your mood and other things like that, maybe you have a Fitbit thing, you know, and that you can wear on your belt or a, a, a wristband or a Nike thing you wear in your shoe. <clears throat> they used to have the fuel band. Maybe they will still have the fuel band. There's a, a bit of controversy around that right now. Um, there's the Withings, uh, the Withings scale. 
they're from France, Runkeeper, um, um, a mood thing, and a Zio sleep monitor, which I used a lot. It was very helpful. <clears throat> and here, anybody here from Digifit? I know, okay, Digifit, okay. Wonderful company here in Santa Barbara. Um, Bob's involved as well. Um, doing a very good job pulling all of these together. The problem is, even with really good, good efforts by companies like Digifit, we're still dealing in a world that's largely a pile of silos. So for example, like right now, um, no, I would say nosebleed, wow. Um, uh, heartbleed is this, is this bad thing that's that gotten loose in the world. And in order to deal with heartbleed, the prudent thing to do is change all of your logins and passwords so you're sure that you're not going to get hit, right? Do you know how many logins and passwords you have? Have you bothered to look and see? I've got over 200 on Chrome, I think, and I've got another nearly, nearly that many on Firefox, and a lot of them as well on, on the other browsers. I use Safari and Opera, and that's just on one machine. I also use more than one platform, so I have to change these logins and passwords over and over and over again. This is an example of a massive economic, negative economic externality of the system we've got now, where everybody says, okay, well, it doesn't matter if, if, I'm, if I scatter a thousand ads on the world that nobody clicks on because if I make money on it one click, it's okay. And it's okay if I've got my silo running well because I'm not responsible for all the other silos. But the problem itself is all the silos, that we're still making silos in 2014. It's a, it's, it's, it's a problem. So to sum all that up, the problem is centralization. Pure and simple, we're centralizing things that shouldn't necessarily be centralized. And an irony of this, did you get it? It doesn't, didn't do it, okay. We already tried it from right there in the chair, cool. Um, so this is a problem the internet itself was designed to solve. And it was designed to solve that in 1962, that far back. And it was designed by this guy, Paul Barron. Um, Paul Barron worked for the Rand Corporation, a big defense contractor at the time, maybe still is for all I know. And he worked with a bunch of other guys that wore glasses like that with the narrow, the narrow ties and the white shirts and on raised floors. And, and at the problem, this is the height of the Cold War. This is a, a year in advance of, of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Things could not be more tense between the US and the Soviet Union. And the problem was that we had a, a finite number of big computers and they were still uh, centrally controlled from the Pentagon. And what happens when all these things are hardwired, and whether you take out the middle one or one of these over here, you still have what they call an attack surface that was too big. How do you fix that? And at the time, this was, this was very radical to think outside this box because the only models we had for networks at that time were, for example, A, TV networks, NBC has one head end in, the, in New York, and they're distributing to everybody else, and we could all look at that and see that's a network. It all comes from one place, and it goes out from there. Um, and, for, um, and, and, and the phone company. There was AT&T, and there was nobody else. And in other, country, there was, other countries, there were things called PTTs. And, and they did pretty much the same thing. They were all monopolies. And it was very hard to think outside the monopoly box. But what he said was, we could actually decentralize this. That's an improvement. But the ideal thing would be to distribute all of the connectivity so it's not centrally controlled. And the attack surface is no more at any point than one node or one, one position on this network. And you could take out a link here or a link there, and the whole thing will still work OK. So another way to look at this as the internet played out, as the internet was developed, because the internet was based on this. And there's a long, wonderful story about how that happened to turn into ARPANET. ARPANET tested this out, found it worked well, and, um, and, then we, and then we created the internet protocol, TCP IP, which actually looks more like this. Any one of us by choice, we're not locked into, this one isn't locked into communicating with that one. Any one of us can connect to anything. And every point on that network is independent. This is D, this is an independent network. This is what we created with the internet, and that was a really great design because it's very robust and very invulnerable to, to, to attack. Like, of course, you know, um, Target got attacked, right? Much bigger attack surface. And it was a really ideal system, but in 1995, when we got dial-up and we got our first ISPs and the internet was commercialized, 
what happened was because we had relatively weak computers at the ends of phone lines that weren't on all the time, that we located all of the agency, all the capacity to act on servers. And we came up with a system called Client Server. It had actually been around for a while, but Client Server was the architecture of how we built out the web, especially. And so the way it actually looks is more like this. So we're, we're, always, we're always the calf here, and, and we go to websites, we go browsing. Browsers, remember the, inter, the, the information superhighway? That was the original concept of the internet. And your browser was going to be like your car on the information superhighway. Or you were a surfer on your surfboard. And you had absolute freedom. You could ride any wave you want. That was the idea. Well, here's what browsing turned into. Okay, You go browsing, and you go to the, to the websites for the milk of HTML and these things called cookies that could track you around. And the original idea behind cookies um, that Lou Montulli came up with at Netscape in 1994 and implemented in 1995 was that the, the, the servers could remember what's called state. Who, what would, you don't have to log in again. We see you. We've got a cookie on your machine. We know who you are. Thank you very much. We'll autofill things. We'll remember where you were last time. It was a relatively innocent thing in its day, but the way it's been implemented since then, it's gone nuts, and now we are carrying thousands of, of cookies in our machines that are busy tracking us and reporting back, and so many of our apps, for that matter. You can be using paper toss or something on the subway, and when you get out and you hook up to the, to the net, all of a sudden it's reporting back that you were using it on the subway or whatever. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of thing that, that we have now. But the important thing to remember, and this is for the purpose of, of the discussion we're going to have shortly, is that the internet is, in fact, still personal. That was the way it was designed in the first place. It's end-to-end, -end, it's point-to-point, -point, it's any-to-any. -any. Every single one of us now, we have far more compute power. We should have far more autonomy. So I've been working on encouraging development of tools over the last few years that encourage both independence and better ways of engaging. And so I want to go over some bets to make. And, here, and I'm going to number them. They're going to be five. And the first one is sovereign identity. And I'm going to attach to some of these actual people that your names you can write down or remember because they're doing, they're saying or doing cool stuff. Um, sovereign identity, this is Devin Lafredo, by the way, and he actually goes out of his way. It's very hard to find a picture of him on the net. This is a good looking young, youngish guy, but doesn't want to be that public about it. This company is called Noise Ivy. It's actually electronic toys, DIY kind of do it yourself toys for kids. His blog is Moxie Tongue, and he's at NZN on Twitter. But he came up with this term, and that's why I want to give him credit for it. I mean, it's a fairly obvious thing once you think about it, but which is the identity that each of us has that keeps us sane. What, what's behind that first, person, um, that first person pronoun, I and me and mine, what keeps it sane is that we know who we are. We know who we were yesterday, we know who we are tomorrow and the next day, and we can govern how we present ourselves to the world. I'm Doc Searles to most of the world. To my family, I'm David or I'm Dave. To old friends, some of the same things. In my wallet are these things that Devin calls administrative identities. Most of what we call our identities are administrative. They're not ours. They were given to us by the DMV or by the church or by the employer or the hospital or the healthcare system. And those that we carry in our wallet are administrative in nature. They are also siloed. We don't manage them all at once. We have to go separately to all of them. Right? That's essentially a problem. But if we solve sovereign identity the right way, then we can create solutions that, for example, allow us to change our last name, change our, uh, change our email address, change anything else with all these different administrative identities through one system that's ours and not theirs. But we have to solve the identity problem first that way. So the second is personal clouds. With personal clouds, we have, once again, a term, clouds, that is today even, that's a B2B term. If you look up clouds, you follow clouds on the net right now. All of the, everything written about clouds is about what companies do with companies or companies offer to us. Apple has my cloud or iCloud for me, you know. Any company that says my or me for us is weird. That's always weird having somebody use that pronoun for us. You know, it, it invades the space that our sovereign identity lives in. So. The idea behind a personal cloud is this is the data, this is the place that we keep the data that we need to deal with all these administrative entities in the world. 
Of course, we already have personal clouds. It's called our hard drive, right? We have a lot of information on there. But the information that we need to interact with the world in a way that we control, we set the terms, we control the way it works, is going to happen in personal clouds. This thing on the left up here um, is at personal-cloud.org. It's actually just a discussion list at this point, all developers. Um, but they've already got a logo that they got from 100 Designs, or whatever it's called. Animate uh, Data for Good is a company in New York. They are a cloud service provider. This company here, Respect Network, which um, is going to hold a worldwide launch that uh, Joyce and I are going to be involved with. It's a worldwide tour. tour. They have dozens of, of future or present cloud service providers that are all going to offer substitutable services. So if you want your fully encrypted data in a cloud to be able to move like you move your money from bank to bank, there's going to be a business in personal clouds where you can move your important personal information from one cloud service provider to another uh, in a substitutable way. So that's the Respect Network. Personal.com uh, is a company in Washington, D.C. that's been at this for a while, and they're cool. And so out of the many companies that are doing this, I put their name on there. The next is truly private data and communications. So right now, think about email and how we do email. Email is one of the great miraculous creations of, uh, of, of, of the Internet fathers. They came up with this really cool protocol or set of protocols, IMAP and POP3 and, and uh, SMTP that allow us to do email and not be locked into anybody's system. The problem with it is it's utterly exposed. It's not only full of spam, but we're exposed in many other ways. How many people here have Gmail? Okay. Not only is Google reading your mail, they're reading the mail over everybody you communicate with. That's weird. <laughs> That's weird. That's out of our control. We should, we should, Email shouldn't be so hard that we need Google to do it for us. So, so there's a company, a new company I want to introduce to you and tell you a little bit more about what they do. These are these guys. They're actually a bunch of British guys that um, rented a, um, uh, a, a convertible in L.A., drove up here and hung out at our house for a few days while they were working on their stuff. A guy in the lower right, his name is, is David Salas, goes by the name Big Davey. He's a, he's a math whiz and a crypto genius, and he's come up with a company and a concept called Credo. And what Credo lets you do, and this is brand new, it isn't publicized yet, what Credo lets you do is have completely encrypted point-to-point -point communications and data transfer between anybody. You're talking to your shrink, you're talking to your lawyer, you're talking to um, uh, your bank, you want to send data to them. You should be able to do that over a completely encrypted channel that you're in control of. If you're in the marketplace and you want to communicate to a company but not tell them who you are yet, but you want to let them know you're a human being and not a bot, how do you do that? Credo has an answer for that as well. And it's very simple and it's low level and it's going to be involved in payments and many other things. We, in fact, met them through Visa Europe. Uh, that was a connection that we had to them. So, so that's one of the things to watch for, completely uh, uh, private data and communications. I mentioned the commercial side of this. There's something called intent casting. Originally, we called it a personal RFP. This is, this is advertising that goes from us to the marketplace. I'm on the wharf. I need a stroller for twins for two hours. Um, I mean, in the next two hours, I've got $200 who's coming through, but I don't want to tell you who I am or exactly where I am or anything else about myself. I want to be able to be a qualified lead, but on my terms and not just on your terms. So, and I want to be able to do this at first, at least at first, anonymously. How do we do that? Credo provides part of that. But the whole concept of intent casting and turning this whole thing around where instead of having this massive, incredibly inefficient system that Google, all due credit to them, has pioneered, where they're guessing at you all the time. They're trying to create the perfect portrait of you, and they're guessing at you all the time. Wrong 99 or 999 times out of 1,000. One time. This is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for help with. And here's money involved in this, too. That is going to completely change the equation for how this stuff works, because it's a heck of a lot more efficient. The fifth thing is the internet of me and my things. That's a term that came from Phil Windley. I'm showing his picture here. Um, Phil is the former CIO for the state of Utah. He's a PhD computer scientist, teaches at BYU. Um, and is a real genius. He's one of the guys I think in the future we're going to look back on and say he's one of the people who made the world that we're doing now. Um, Kinetics is his company. It's small. He vets everything he's doing. He writes it up at windley.com um, 
and he's available at Winley at, at Winley on, on Twitter. But his position on the Internet of Things, which is a hot term right now, and if you look up Internet of Things or IOT and Trillion, you'll find lots of stories about how this is going to be a trillion dollar marketplace. Here's what Phil says. It can't be that everything, almost all of what's being written and said about the Internet of Things right now is the CompuServe of things and the AOL of things and the Prodigy of things. We're at that stage, right, where they don't get along. Google just bought Nest. Nest is a great company. They make this cool thermostat and a, and a smoke detector and other things like that. But that's going to be the Internet of Google things, and they're going to be the Internet of Apple things, because you have the Apple Watch, you got your Apple computer, you got your iPhone. Those are in that little cloud. But that's not the Internet of those things. That's the silo of something. And almost everybody's thinking in terms of silos right now. Bad idea. Phil says, we had, we need the, if, we're not the, if we need the Internet of things, we're going to have to have the Internet of people, and those people have to be in charge of not only their own clouds, but the clouds of their things. So. I have up here hanging on my bag, and I can, I can actually go to the next, next slide because it, what, he, what, he, what he talks about is market intelligence that flows both ways. On my bag here, there's a tag, and it's got a QR code on it, and anybody, anybody wants to scan it, you guys in the front row, if you feel like it, no, no need. But if you do scan it, what you're going to see is something that says, this is Doc Searle's bag. Here's his phone number, here's his wife's phone number, give him a call. He seems to have left it here. You don't need to cover it with something and blow it up because somebody left it here, right? So that's a rational thing in a lot of airports today, so if you leave it around. So, but the interesting thing about this is that the bag has a cloud. It doesn't need intelligence in it. You don't need a chip. You don't have to wait for Intel to invent the chip to put in that bag or to sell with that bag. Instead, you can just put a QR code on it, and you can have it scan, and it goes to the cloud for that bag that you own and you control. But it's not just so you can have it, you can, you can find it again if you happen to lose it. It's so you can have a direct conduit with the company that made it if you want. So for example, I've also got one on my Canon camera in the bag here. I'd like to have a much closer relationship with Canon than I do right now, right? Almost the way customer support works now is that the product goes down the conveyor belt and it goes through distribution and it goes out through retail and it goes, drops into a bucket called the customer and then it goes over on the seller's side to um, the, you know, the customer support system or the CRM system, which is incentivized for the most part to minimize customer contact and treat customers as templates. And very little good intelligence comes back through that system. There's a really good cartoon. I didn't put it up here, but it, uh, it, it, it ran while Joyce and I were in Australia. When we were coming to a hotel and I was looking in the New Yorker, as a New Yorker cartoon that says, there's somebody behind the counter who says, who says, what, can I do anything to improve your experience at this hotel, or are you just going to go rant about it on the internet? Right? Because that's what our choice is. And we do that. We'll go rant about it on the internet, or in a comment thing, or, or go on to you know, Facebook, because we're so powerless. But what if we actually have a direct connection with them? It's not just being part of their loyalty program, but where that product, that camera, that bag, those shoes, you know, these, this furniture, this wash machine comes with its own cloud, and in that cloud you can have your your um, uh, your service manuals, anything that to, to the firmware to update it, whatever else it might be, and you can communicate back to them. Here's my experience with these shoes. Here's something that's coming off of these shoes. Here's something that didn't work with this wash machine, and you do that at the point where there's something actually going wrong, and they get intelligence out of it, and you get continuous product improvement out of it. So. That's Phil's insight, and, and what he's done is um, created this project, which is called Fuse. Um, this is a Kickstarter project that he did a few months ago. They raised, raised enough money to do the development on it. What Phil recognized was that the product category that is most likely going to succeed with this, because it's the largest one, is actually cars. Now, an interesting thing about cars is that the largest branded purchase that we're going to make in our lifetimes is a car, probably. You know, a few of us, I guess, will get a yacht or something. But even those aren't necessarily branded like cars are. You know, we spend more on a house, but that's not a brand. But you buy a Ford, you buy a Mercedes, you buy something else like that. They have dealers. You're buying in that brand. And, and all of them since the late 90s have had something called the ODB2 port, which is a jack that's on, under the dashboard behind 
behind the steering wheel in most cars. And that's so they can do diagnostics. They wanted to standardize diagnostics and smog testing and stuff like that. So, so it's basically made for the dealers, but you can use it too. And so what Phil did with Fuse, what he's doing with Fuse right now, is has this gizmo that you stick on the ODB2 port, and it has cellular, cellular communications in it, and it has a GPS in it. But it's to collect data that the car is throwing off about emissions, about the engine quality, all the things that they're looking at at all times, which you don't ever see. They're not on your dashboard. There are many, many things happening with your car that don't show up on the dashboard. A lot of it's historical, a lot of it's live, but it's interesting stuff, especially if you're a car enthusiast or you want to maximize the life of your car. But almost everybody even thinking about this right now is creating a silo for it. Phil's not inventing a silo. This is going to be your data and it's going to be transferable between any of the, your own data store, your own personal cloud, or any of the other cloud service providers that are out there. So that's, that's one of the things that's coming along as well. So I reported on this, all five of the things I just went over, um, in a book called The Intention Economy, When Customers Take Charge, two years ago. It came out from Harvard Business Review Press, and I highly recommend getting it, of course. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, but an interesting market test on that was a fun thing that happened because the uh, Harvard Business Review sent out copies to lots of the publications. And one of them landed on the desk of a guy named Robert Thompson, who was the, at that time the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. And he read it and he said, he said, wait a minute, you're right, the customers are going to be in charge. We need to be covering this and I want a cover story on this in the review section, which is the big feature section that runs every weekend in the Wall Street Journal. And so he had the editor of the review section contact me. He said, the boss wants your book compressed to about 1,000 words. Can you do that for us? I said, sure. And it ran, and it looked like this. Um, the customer as a god. And it, it, it completely freaked me out at the time. because I looked, This is the entire front page of, the, of that section of the Wall Street Journal. So I said, this is Dianetics. <laughs> this is, <laughs> wait a minute. This, that's not right, you know, and I would never say the customer is a god, but, you know, I used to work in the newspaper business, and there's a reason why the people who write the articles don't write the headlines, right? And it's actually proved to be true, I think, because that's what we want. We want, we've talked about, which is, about we're working for the customer, and IBM says the chief executive customer is running your company, but most of that's just, just talk. Actually giving the customer the means by which to be fully empowered agents of themselves, to have sovereignty, to have independence, to have the ability to, to be in charge of, for example, their terms. Right now, Customer Commons, which is, a, uh, I'll tell you about in a second, um, is working as a client of the Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard Law School on terms that we can assert when we, when we do business with somebody. To, in a B2B context, terms are, are very even. Um, we have freedom of contract in, in, say, if we want to rent a wheelbarrow. You know, I rent the wheelbarrow, I sign a thing that says, here's 40 bucks, I'm gonna, you get to keep it if I return it in bad shape. That's freedom of contract. We don't have that in the industrial, not just the internet, the entire industrial age. We're saying yes and accept to so many terms that we, we never read because there's no point in reading and that's a completely broken system. So if we're all gods, then we can have even terms with the companies that we do business with. And those are probably going to be better terms than the ones they think they're coercing at this point. So, but still, you know, so that's the look. All those things, I believe, are going to succeed in at least the next five years or later. We always tend to overestimate in the short term and underestimate in the long. So, but I think all those things are going to come to pass. But in the meantime, we're still living in a matrix. We're still living in peak surveillance. We're still living in a system in which it's normative to think, geez, I guess we're living here, there's not much we can do about it. But we can, so my sort of parting words for dealing with that are wake up, Neo. And for those of you who are, who, are, who are familiar with that movie will know what that's about. Um, some ways to participate, I'm just gonna go over a few of these. Um, there's a Project VRM which I've been working on for years and it's mostly a mailing list and a bunch of events. Um, and Customer Commons, uh, which is a, a new organization, and I encourage participating in that. Respect Network I mentioned earlier, which is a collection of cloud service providers. Uh, personalcloud.org, which is a mailing list. We the Data is another one they're putting on events. There's one coming up in Berkeley in a couple weeks. Indie Web Camp is another one. That, that's mostly in San Francisco, a bunch of meetups there. Indie is a hot term right now. 
Um, it works with movies. It should work with internet stuff as well. And these are two that I'm fond of at the moment because Mozilla is going through, as you probably read, a lot of turmoil at, the, at this point. The guy they elevated as the CEO, a guy named um, Brendan Eich, who invented uh, JavaScript. Um, Brendan didn't work out for reasons that aren't worth going into. Um, but the main problem for them is they're torn, especially around Firefox, between working for the advertisers and working for the advertising industry and the fact that 90% of their income comes from Google. Um, and wanting to work for the individual. And so I wrote a piece about them, and we've, I know a lot of people there, and we're in conversation with them, and it's very interesting to see what they're going through right now. And it's really important to look at Firefox, because Firefox is the only browser working for us. Chrome works for Google, Safari works for Apple, uh, Opera's too small to matter, and, and uh, Internet Explorer works for Microsoft. But Firefox at least is trying to work for us and they're really, really struggling with it right now and I think they're gonna get, I think we're gonna help them out effectively. And a lot of this is gonna be talked about in a couple of weeks at an event called the Internet Identity Workshop that runs May 6th to 8th in, uh, at the Computer History Museum in San Francisco, in, I'm, I'm sorry, in Mountain View. This is a, uh, the, the logo of it which is done by what I, one of Phil Windley's. Yeah, there's about a dozen questions that came in. And some of them are similar, so they've been curated. Jeff asks, have we really reached peak surveillance? I can imagine billions of mosquito-sized camera drones. Another audience member who asked not to be identified asks, do you think drones will elevate, I guess no pun intended, in the concept of peak surveillance? Yeah, I suppose, sure. sure. I, I, when, when Amazon said they were you know, thinking of using drones, I thought, that's cool. Order something cheap and keep the drone. You know, that'd be a fun thing to do. <laughs> what happened to the drone? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, I, I mean, obviously lots of little things spying on you all the time is a, is a real concern and it's already happening to some degree. There's things in the retail environment that are being sold already that, that are tracking you. If you're, 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 I don't know if you noticed, but your iPhones now come with Bluetooth turned on by default. You can't, you have to consciously turn it off. Didn't used to be that way. It was off by default. Now it's on by default. And that's in part so you can be followed and you can have an intimate relationship that you don't know about with, uh, with retailers. But I don't, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. I think, I think there's this kind of an air traffic control problem with drones, you know, and we're like one accident away from the thing being delayed 10 years. You know, that can happen anytime. So I'm not too worried about it. Okay. Mark asks, Doc, what will be the secret to creating a vibrant startup community? Well, money helps. Um, uh, boy, that's, that's so broad. I, I'll, I'll tell you one of the things, um, and this is, this is for the VCs out there and for people who are funding things, is, is just don't go with the herd mentality. I mean, there are so many great ideas that are not being funded right now, and, and I've just dealt with so many of them. And Phil, for example, who I just think is doing incredible stuff, has had a hard time because it's so outside the box. It's really outside the box. Now, maybe here in the South Coast, this itself is outside in the boxes, then maybe something could be cultivated here. Um, but I think that there's, there's just so much, um, there's, there's so many ways to say no. It's so easy to say no for the most obvious reason, like the popular kids aren't doing it. Um, but I think, you know, I just keep an open mind, I think is the main thing. What market forces or other forces do you see that are going to lead to these very common sense steps that you're talking about? Um, seems to me that there's a lot of apathy that goes on and a lot of people just don't want to think about this stuff. So where's the demand coming from for these very common sense solutions that you're talking about? Okay, two, um, two, two brief stories. One is um, when um, Netscape open source their browser. Um, I interviewed Mark Andreessen for, for, uh, for Linux Journal. One of the first things he said, it just dropped out of his mouth, but it kind of blew my mind how obvious it was and nobody talked about it. He said, all technology trends start with technologists. Everything starts small, right? You got to get some techies doing things that other people aren't doing and then it catches on from there. Nothing, when people speak about market forces, which you were doing earlier when you were sort of off mic, um, is if everything starts out with the dial at 10 and then goes up to 11 from there. It doesn't start out there. Everything starts out small one way or another and almost always discredited at first and with failures and the rest of it. So we need the techies to adopt 
first. The other is um, we, we tend to think, especially those of us who are steeped in marketing, that you find what the market wants and you give them something. That basically necessity is the mother of your invention. But really, it works the other way around. You know, I see a fax machine, now I need it. You know, I see, before that I saw a telex and I needed it, right? Um, uh, when smartphones were around for a long time before the iPhone came along, there were Palm Pilots and Palm this is and that's and there were others like that and they were kind of hard to use and they were big and clunky and they kind of cost more. They had their virtues but they were also siloed, right? Um, but I remember um, I once got Joyce a Nokia phone, a, a relatively cheap Nokia phone that would allow texting. It turned, you twist it sideways and now there's a whole keyboard there. Because I traveled to Europe a lot, they text a lot in Europe, I thought texting was cool. And she texted me back just the word no. <laughs> it was hard to use. Hell with it. I'll give you a call, right? But then one day here in Santa Barbara, she came home and she never wants to spend money on anything new, okay? And she saw an iPhone and she said, I can use that. I can put that to use. And she is still teaching me things about our iPhones at this point. Apple, what Apple did with inventing the iPhone, which frankly Android knocked off to a large degree, was an invention that mothered the necessity. In all these categories I just gave you, we need something to mother the necessity. Phil did the fuse thing because he wants to mother the necessity in car enthusiasts. That's who he's after. It's the niche. Big, big high ticket category, small niche inside it, proof of concept, work on the UI, iterate it forward, see how it goes. You know? so, that's, I think the only way it's going to happen is if those two things happen. We have the inventions of mother necessity and, and also that the techies, you know, the, the specialists adopt it first. Doc, this is from Steve. I'm a journalist for a paywalled niche publication. Our approach is to create news that people value enough to pay for so that we don't have to do shady things with our advertising. Do you think that approach can scale beyond local or niche publications? I don't think that approach can scale at all, actually. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it, it's important to understand. I, I'm a journalist primarily and have been all my life. And I, um, I'm trying not to give too much backstory here, but it's, it's important to recognize that what's happened in journalism um, as a catastrophe in a category puts to shame what's happening, say, with movies or with the rec record, record industry. The record industry is doing fine. Musicians are doing as well as they ever have on the whole. Almost like 90%, some very high percentage of people who had jobs in journalism 20 years ago are not doing journalism now. Um, all of the papers, everybody has to experiment. All of the paywalled things right now, they're all experimental. They're all, this is the best we can do. And, and they're fine. I mean, I, I don't mind that the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal have paywalls. But I quit subscribing to the Wall Street Journal, even though I like it a lot. It's too expensive. Um, you know, and I, I know a number of other people who have. It's, it's going to be hard. And, and what, they've, what, they've, what they're all still doing, and this, I don't think this has annoyed me on any publication more than the Santa Barbara News Press, I think. Um, because, you know, but they exemplify this. You know, the, you, they, they want you to, um, actually the News Press is an exception this way, because they want to charge for all of it. But the, the New York Times and others will give it away today. Right, and then charge for the archives. Do it the other way around. You know, do it the way it is in the everyday world. Today, charge for today's news, and give away yesterday's and the day before and the rest of it. Just put it in archives so it could be found. Think of if the archives for the news press were completely public. How much richer would this culture be for that? Right. Instead, you have to pay three fifty or whatever for a single article, and it's all locked up back there and it doesn't work. I think in the internet age, we actually need what I call charge for the news and pay, for, you know, and give away the olds. And, but nobody's done that. I've been suggesting that for 10 years and nobody's done it. So, Steve, wherever you are, um, that's a, a rough answer. But, I, but any experiment is good. I think just, you know, keep experimenting with it, see what works. But I don't think anything that's being tried today scales very well, unless you were the New York Times and you were the entirety of your world. Okay, this, this is uh, one of mine. Have we become too social? our access, our ability to broadcast, thereby weakening our independence? Yes, if, you, if by social you mean the way that um, Facebook has defined it, which is 
um, here's a public place where you can splatter everything all, all over the whole world and we can follow you and it's completely insecure. Um, there's a really great <clears throat> Onion story from a few months back that said an entire generation ineligible for public office in 2030. <laughs> right? and, and here's a girl at a kegger and here's a, here's a, you know, a guy with the world's largest bong, you know, and the rest of it. Um, that's, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, th I think that that's dysfunctional, but it's also, it, it, it's important to recognize the internet as we have it today is 18 years old. It's barely old enough to drive. You know, it's, everything we're doing there is still an experiment. Everything we're doing there is still provisional. Um, you know, even Amazon, Amazon's 18 years old. I mean, this is nothing in, 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 the, in the larger scheme of things. And th there's an old saying from Lord Rothschild, you know, you, you, you should, um, it's an investment advice, you know you know, sell on trumpets and buy on cannons, right? There are trumpets right now for the way Facebook does things, the way Google does things. Um, but there's, the cannons are the, the, the Snowdens of the world saying, here's what else is going on. I think at a certain point people wake up and they say, there's gotta be a better way. We, we've been social as long as we've had civilization. And, we, and longer than that, we're social animals. And we, we have in, in, this, in this environment, like privacy, pri I didn't go into privacy very far, but. Um, privacy is controversial on the net. It's not controversial in the everyday world. This is a privacy technology. We cover ourselves with clothing. We have doors and windows and shades and other things that are very highly well understood and developed over a very long period of time. On the net, we've got squat for that, you know, so we got to develop it. Give us time. Well, here's a question from Steve about that. We hear that privacy is the price of free. Why can't I pay some amount of money every year to have my privacy respected? How much would it cost me to have the services that I enjoy now and my privacy? And this is a, another question from John connected to that. Will there one day be a company whose sole purpose is to keep you anonymous? Well, Credo is going to be one of those that I mentioned earlier, uh, though I think a lot of their stuff is going to be buried in other people's stuff because it's going to be a ubiquitous way of encrypting everything. Um, I think the idea that, geez, privacy is valuable and so I ought to be able to pay somebody for it is kind of not the right way to conceive it. I mean, I don't, I mean, I buy um, clothes, but I'm not, I don't look at Uniqlo where I got this jacket as my privacy provider, right? I mean, I just bought it once and it covers me enough. And um, I, I think that in, in time, because privacy does have value, there are going to emerge means by which we control it ourselves. Um, we don't pay somebody else for it. It's just, it, it's a grace of civilization that we equip ourselves with. And uh, Chris here has a question. Yeah, uh, what do you think about the Tor network as a tool to it's protect cool. your privacy? Cool, the Tor is great, it's just hard to use. Okay. You know, but... Um, Could you tell everyone what Tor is? Yeah, Tor is, Tor is a way to an anonymize your surfing, basically, by running your queries and other things through a whole lot of servers, so it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. That's probably not an orthodox explanation of it, but it's probably close enough. But basically, it's, it's very handy for people who are in China and other places and don't want to be found out. Um, uh, and, but it's really inefficient. If you add Tor to your browser, often it slows things down to a terrible crawl. And uh, I, I hate to say I took mine off a while ago when I was using it um, because I just found it too hard to maintain. But it's a great idea. I mean, I think anything like that, anything that protects our privacy, great. Thank you. Welcome. This is a question from David. One of the topics you covered was emergent models of CRMs. W could you speak on why advertising as we know it is dead? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's one of the topics that we, uh, we had for this. Those are two different things with CRM and, and advertising. Uh, CRM is customer relationship management. VRM, which is my project, um, was named as a customer side counterpart of that. CRM is a, about a $20 billion business that has um, Oracle and SAP and Microsoft and, and uh, um, especially Salesforce, probably the best known company there. For the most part, CRM is not about customer relationship management. It is like what Salesforce's name says. It's about selling stuff. Uh, not about servicing stuff. Servicing stuff is very secondary concern for CRM in general. That's just sort of the way it's emerged. It wasn't meant that way in the first place, but VRM was created in part as a concept at, to fix what wasn't working with CRM. CRM was like, it wanted to be one hand of two shaking, 
they never acknowledge there was somebody at the other end, so it just kind of slaps you around, right? You know, so we wanted to have another hand shaking there, and what is that hand, and what does that look like? As for why advertising is dead, I should qualify that by saying there are two kinds of advertising that have been totally conflated in the last few years. One is plain old brand advertising, which you get when you watch television, or you look at a billboard, or you're reading a magazine, or a newspaper, or listening to the radio. It is not personal. It may be targeted to a group that you are part of, but it, doesn't, it isn't sniffing your pants to see who you are in order to give you a better advertising experience. This is the old Madison Avenue kind of advertising. There's a really great piece I cite in the book called The Waste in the Advertising, and Advertising is the Part That Works. It was written in 1984, and the point was that if you're Pepsi and you sponsor the ball game, even if somebody watching it doesn't ever drink a Pepsi, they know that's a substantial company. If you want to be a substantial company, advertise. Advertising is great. I, I, I co-founded and helped run an advertising agency. It was very successful in Silicon Valley for 20 years. Advertising is a fine thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that kind of advertising. There is something wrong with the kind of advertising that wants to put you in this uncanny valley, it's called, where you don't know whether the message coming at you is coming from a human being or from something that's been following you around. Or if it has been following you around, it kind of creeps you out. And that's what we have with, not so much with Google, because most of Google's money actually comes from um, Ad, Ad, um, AdSense, which is what you get when you're uh, uh, searching, but from the kind of advertising that is, that is you know, based on surveillance. And I think that's, that's not descended from Madison Avenue. It's descended from the direct mail business, which is also the junk mail business. And those are both called advertising, and they are conflated together these days. And the latter has the major problems. The former is actually being neglected right now. The old Mad Men kind of advertising is kind of fallen by the wayside as a concern, even though there's plenty of evidence that it works as well as it ever did. Um, for the most part, if you're working in advertising today, you have to be doing programmatic ad tech, which is all this surveillance-based stuff. And I think that's the stuff that's in trouble because we're not, as the customers, are not happy with it. Yeah, there's still six, seven more questions that have come in the last couple of minutes, but feel free to ask them directly from the audience as they come in. There's one right here. There are uh, millions of people who wouldn't have understood a word of this and who, um, you know, live in uh, either rural areas or in uh, electronically isolated uh, parts of cities and uh, will probably never have technological sophistication and probably will pass that cultural attitude onto their children, which may or may not be a 100% successful uh, transmission to their children, but will probably have a degree of success. Um, in that context, is there any wisdom that you've come up with regarding that really large part of the population? Well, there are a couple of things. One is um, there are a lot of people for whom the Internet's, the internet's never going to touch. But I'm not sure it's as large as you seem to be suggesting. You know, so how many people watch television? It's close to 100%. That's a complicated technology. And it's moved over and over to cable and satellite now. That's a communication channel. That can be taken advantage of. Um, in Africa, by far, the most, the most interesting and innovative uses of cellular telephony right now are in Africa. There are whole economies that are based on cell phones in Africa. Um, the sophistication of people who we assume are not sophisticated is often remarkably large. There's a really great story that ran several years ago about a guy who did some research in India where in the poorest of the poor parts of New Delhi or some other large city, he put in a kiosk that was some kind of a, um, a hardened computer where anybody could interact with it. And the last thing you heard from it was from some kids who wrote on it, we've disabled the thing that you watch us with. So I think, I, I think it's, human beings are unbelievably, amazingly resourceful. I mean, I think being resourceful is the most human characteristic we have. Um, and probably tied with that is the fact that we are all different. We look different, we act different, even identical twins are different in, in substantial ways. And, and that too is part of it, because the system that we have now, ever since industry won the Industrial Revolution, we've been dealing with, with scale. We want to get scale as much as we can get for our large companies. Every large company is looking for scale. Every small company is looking for scale. Nothing wrong with that. We need scale for ourselves. And 
And I think actually some of the most interesting work that's going to be done is going to be done in what we used to call the third world when we had three of them. Maybe with the rise of the Russian Empire, we'll get three again. I don't know. But, the, um, but it's, uh, I'm much more optimistic about what can be done there than, than a lot of other people. But I'm generally optimistic anyway. So, Doc, we have a question. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to email these. They were blocked. Um, I was curious about... <laughs> True story. Uh, I was curious if you could follow up a little bit more about privacy with regard to, uh, first of all, things like chips and credit cards, photos on credit cards, and, and also the invention of fully private networks that are not connected to the internet that might be akin to what you see in banking or the military itself. Um, networks that might operate, for example, regionally in a city that would have a value proposition of being off the internet. Mm -hmm. That would be completely local. Well, there's a lot in there. Um, the first part of that I could answer by saying that it's sort of an interesting fact that some of the credit card companies don't want to be in the card business. They'd rather not have cards at all. <laughs> you just have a way that you're, you're yourself, you manifest to yourself to some system, and it knows it's you, and you don't have to be carrying these cards around. Another thing is that, and this is not a well-known thing, is that the credit card companies actually, like Visa and MasterCard, go out of their way to know as close to nothing about you as possible. That's, they're very different than the way we tend to think of them, but that's one of the ways they tend to work. So I'm actually optimistic about that. I think that with Credo and other things like that, we're going to see an evolution of, of the whole card convention where we have to have a wallet full of things that all don't belong to us but belong to other parties that have a lot of exposure like we saw with the Target story. So I'm optimistic that that stuff's going to be worked out over the next few years. As for local regional networks that people do for themselves that may or may not be off the internet, great, I hope those happen. I don't, I'm, I don't know any particular cases, um, um, but you know, I think, um, you know, I think there's all kinds of possibilities there, so. You know, it's, it's a huge world. You know, we can, we can connect it all kinds of ways. We don't have to do it Apple's way or Google's way or Microsoft's way or Amazon's way. We can do it our own ways. And this came in 15 minutes ago, but it's connected from DJ. You mentioned the idea of the intent casting and the example of the woman on the wharf desiring a stroller. If the initiator can completely veil who and where she is, how does the receiver validate credibility? It seems to me that there's a paradox here between privacy of identity and preventing spam. Well, there's a couple of things. One is that um, that example that I gave is probably not an ideal one because she can be found. Hi, I'm a woman who needs a stroller on a, on a wharf. You could probably, if you're a bad person, you could probably find her. But, um, but that said, with Credo, without going into how it works, and I'm not qualified to say so, you can at least say I'm a human being. You can at least say, and, and through, Things like Respect Network has a, a trust framework that allows you, if you wish, to have your val validity as a real customer um, validated without having to rely on one big company to say, this person's cool. We can, that's a social thing that can be developed. That, you know, I can, like, you know, I, I could get, enlist all you guys in this room to say, well, this guy seems to know what he's talking about on this one subject, say, for, for example. Um, but there's, there are lots of ways we can validate each other without relying on a giant institution to do it for us. And though it's hard to explain exactly how that will work, take my word for it that there are really smart people working on it. Uh, yeah, uh, spoke a lot about uh, privacy. I was wondering about the security market, especially in light of the NSA events and, and um, where the market is going right now. What opportunities do you see and the importance of that, obviously? Well, you're, you're, de you're dealing with a subject that's not necessarily mine, so, um, but I know an awful lot of people who are around that privacy and security tend to get conflated a lot. Privacy is how we feel about um, our exposure. Um, security is how we keep things safe one way or another. I think that there's, we're kind of at a crossover point right now where the old ways of doing that are starting to look a little bit shaky and the new ways are not quite developed enough so that we can say that we can rely on them yet, um, but that's a good time. I mean, if, if you're developing a, anything new, that sort of liminal in-between time, I think, is a good one. That sounds like a cop-out answer, but maybe it is. But I think, I think there's a lot that can be done there, I guess, is a 
brief way of putting it. And Doc, Mark wants to know if Snowden should release the rest of the information. I don't know what he's got. So um, I, I have to say, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put this on the line. I think Snowden did the world a great big favor. Um, there's nothing that he's said so far that is, should surprise us, quite honestly. I mean, a spy organization was spying. <laughs> what do you expect, right? You know, so, um, you know, spy organizations were spying. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing, though, is that they, it, it, it has to do with what this attack surface is. You know, how exposed are we? To me, the important thing about what he exposed wasn't that the NSA was being lame or malevolent, but that it was modeling what it did and took advantage of, of the systems that Google and Facebook and these companies had already put in place. And, and from a business perspective, what he did was a big favor by showing us that large siloed systems are inherently vulnerable. Paul Barron knew that in 1962. We built the internet to overcome that. Let's go back to first principles there and build out stuff that's compatible with the internet as it was originally designed <clears throat> instead of the slightly decentralized CompuServe plus prodigy system that we're seen to be developing now. Hi, I want to follow on that question of your, your intersection of security and privacy. Just uh, thinking uh -oh. about the heartbeat, <laughs> the heartbeat is issue that just came up, and RSA's implication oh, you mean the, the heart in terms bleed? of heart heartbeat bleed? security yeah. issue. I mean, they, back, we trust that our information was private or, or secure, when in fact for two years it was not at all. Uh, so my question, I guess, to that is, uh, do those two incidents and the RSA implication, basically, that they were purchased to put an incorrect system in for the government? Is that a milestone that's going to make things better, or do we just accept that going forward as reality? I think it's certainly a milestone for making things better, and in the meantime, it's, a, it's, it's partial, partial reality. I mean, it's, I haven't changed all my passwords yet. It's going to take a long time. I'll bet most of the people in this room haven't. Have you changed all your passwords, anybody? No. Nobody. Nobody's changed all their passwords. So we're all still exposed, <laughs> right? Um, now, they're going to change the tech that keeps it exposed to some degree, but. Um, a, one of the things, there's a, there's a group that isn't public yet, but it, it will be. This is not like a secret thing. It's just a bunch of actually really alpha geeks that are working on this. Is recognizing, I don't know if you know, but with the, with the, the story with Heartbleed, is that a very well-intended and good techie had an error, right? Just left something open. He's terribly embarrassed about that, but there it is. Um, but we don't have... Um, we don't have civil engineering on the internet like we ought to have. That's not there. We have, things break down and we don't have that tradition of civil engineering yet because it's not mature the way it should be. Um, <clears throat> even the way that the, that the, that the internet that, that we're relying on now, in terms of the wiring of it, it isn't the distributed model, it's the decentralized model. It's, it's Verizon plus Cox plus Time Warner plus Comcast and others that play out the last mile and other people that are involved in that as well, like Netflix and others are sort of players in this thing. There are vulnerabilities in anything that is a single point in which a lot of responsibility is concentrated. And, you know, so, so to me the, the main problem with Heartbleed was not Heartbleed itself, but the fact that 18 years into the internet we're still using passwords and logins. That's crazy. We should, we need to get past that. And, but it's a box that we can't think out of. It's just like we couldn't, just like Paul Barron found, it was very hard for phone companies, even today, to think outside the centralized box. They can't do it. So we need other systems to come in and other guys to think it through. Doc, there's a question switching yeah. gears. Is Ethereum or similar cryptography, crypto, sorry, cryptocurrency system a good solution for personal ownership of data? I know a lot of people who love Ethereum and, uh, and Bitcoin and the Bitcoin protocol and blockchain and all that stuff that I don't understand but I can say. Um, uh, I think cryptocurrency is a really interesting thing. I think that there should be more ways to exchange value than we have now. Um, the cr monetary credit card fiat currency system that we have has vulnerabilities as we know. Um, and I think that there are ways to reckon value and exchange it and that are 
far more sophisticated and simple in a, in a point to point way than, than what we sort of settled on um, several hundred years ago and are still living with. But beyond that, I'm not qualified to say much about it. I'm just sort of intrigued by it and by the fact that there are a lot of really smart people I know who are thinking deeply about it and want to dig into it. So, so that's a, a qualified yes. There are several hands up out here. So, um, so in, in uh, the security space, uh, there's a big push around openness, right? Open standards because anybody can try to hack them, so they should be some of the safest standards you can imagine. Uh, you also talked earlier about how a lot of these services have become almost utility-like. You know, those two things bring up the question of what is, if any, the role of, of government or the role of uh, public entities in uh, either provisioning some of this uh, stuff that's not provisioned by the private sector or uh, looking out for privacy and, and security? And can we trust them, <laughs> given what they already do? Uh, you know, or, or is it better to have, you know, private actors uh, provisioning th these really important well, resources? Boy, well, we need government, we need the rule of law. And there are lots of things that the free and open marketplace is never going to do. It's never going to protect the birds or the trees or the redwoods or any of that kind of stuff. And there, there are lots of ways that we need government involved. Um, and there are lots of ways that, for lack of it, I think we're hurt a little bit right now. Like, as I said earlier, no, no government official, as far as I know, knows exactly what's going on inside Google or Facebook. Um, is this a good or a bad thing? I don't know. I think government can lead in lots of different ways. I think what we're, where we're short is in us leading the government. Um, and there's, um, there are a number of efforts within the VRM world that are called GRM, for Government Relationship Management. And some of them are focused on voting and, and, and essentially replacing the oligarchic, whoever has the most money wins kind of system that we have right now, um, where essentially we're living in a kind of oligarchy where an elite kind of runs things and the lo lobbyists have all the sway. I highly recommend Lawrence Lessig's Republic Lost book on this. It'll depress you totally. Um, uh, also follow everything he says because that might encourage you. Um, but we need, we need people to lead the government, we need the government to lead the way on some things. But in the case of the internet, I can, something Michael Powell, who is now, uh, who is a former FCC chairman under George Bush and who, um, uh, who I know and who is a complicated and interesting person and now is a lobbyist for the cable industry. Um, but once at, a, at an event where we were talking about network neutrality, he said, be careful what you wish for from government because, and he was right about this, he said, I have spoken to everybody in Congress and I can tell you that to a person, almost to a person, there are two things none of them understand. One is economics and the other is technology. <laughs> now proceed, right? <laughs> so, so it, an interesting thing about this topic is that the disconnect between the US and the rest of the whole freaking world is extreme. We have a left versus right thing in this country that's really driven by AM talk radio more than anything else that has separated the left and the right into warring camps where, um, you know, one side is like all about pro-government, the government's policy is going to solve everything, and the other side is saying the market's going to solve everything without any, with, let's just destroy the government and, and let the market do its work when in fact you go overseas, you go to Europe or other places, and there's symbiosis between these things. There's, there is a left and a right, but it isn't quite the hard division that we see here, and there's an understanding in general that you want high-speed trains, you're going to have to have the government involved. You know, you're going to have to have some regulatory apparatus in here that helps us do it. The best thing I think we could do as a country right now is at the state, federal, and local level say, here's how we're going to build out the Internet. Here's how we get fiber to everybody. Anytime you're digging up the roads, you put in conduit. Nothing else, just put in conduit so we can pull something through there later. That we're in a horrible mess around this in the US because we have these three levels where Santa Barbara is different than Ventura, which is different than Santa Maria, and they all have their own different regulatory systems by which lots can't be done if you want to do it at the infrastructure level. 
but having a federal mandate come down from on high is really dangerous right now because the federal government is owned by ca the cable and phone companies, and they're going to do what the cable and phone companies want, which is not the internet. They want to replicate. They are billing companies. They are not communications companies. Their core competence is billing, and so they're going to build things that have cost in them. And the internet that Paul Barron designed succeeded because it's free, <laughs> right? It has no business model, and because it has no business model, it floated everything in the world on top of it. And those companies want to do telephony first or television first and everything else second. And by the way, this is in front of the Supreme Court right now with this Aereo thing, and God knows what the consequences of that are going to be because it's so miscast on both sides, I don't even know where to get start with it. So, but we're, a... we're, we're terribly screwed up, but look to other countries for leadership on this because we're not seeing it here. <laughs> You just said something that makes me think there's a better question here. <laughs> okay, will, will the, this is from Nicholas. Will the sovereign identity or complete privacy look to be maturing with very controlled environments like China? Um, look, look maturing, or what was the word? Nicholas. Will the sovereign identity or complete privacy look to be maturing, a maturing. with very controlled environments like China? Boy, I don't know. I mean, I... I think that these, obviously, it's pro it may ch take off in China first <laughs> for, for reasons of getting around oppression and so forth. Um, but then again, it may get smacked down harder than anywhere else. So I don't know. I've never been to China. So, and I know lots of friends there, and I have so many different stories on what can happen there. Um, most of the people I know who come from China have all kinds of ways of getting around the censorship and the rest of it, and they're very creative about it. Um, but I think... I think the issue of sovereign identity and, and, and empowering individuals is probably not something that arises first in the various Asian countries for various cultural reasons. Um, something I only learned a few days ago is that the one place in the world, one set of places in the world where click-through rates on ads are high are in Asian countries, especially China and Japan for some reason. And, and I, wanted to ask one of the students, one of the Chinese students at NYU the other day, because her Gmail, or somebody that looked like Gmail, was half advertising before she even got down to the, to the text of the, of, of the mail. And why? I don't know. I really don't know. But I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. I am sure that, however, it's going to take off. And it's going to take off where probably the need for it is highest and, and the solutions are most fun. Yeah. Erica, somebody over here? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around what this looks like, what you're talking about, envisioning on the ground. And I'm specifically thinking um, in terms of revolutions, mm -hmm. um, geopolitically, like for thinking, about, thinking back to Arab Spring and how a massive group of people took over, not took over, but capitalized on the centralized social media, right. um, a, a siloed system like you're talking about to create a revolution. So I'm curious in terms of your, what you're talking about and what's coming. Number one, how, it, how could that possibly be good news for revolutions? And two, what, it, what would that look like? Because part of what they were able to do is because it was centralized, instantly it was all set up for them to get out the word. Right. Well, tell that to the people in Turkey right now where Twitter's turned off. Okay, so it's a two-edged sword. On, on the one hand, you have something that's centralized because it's centralized, it's well understood, and everybody's on it. You can make use of it. I think people make use of whatever's there, right? I mean, when I was back in the 60s, it was marching, you know? I was, in, I was a 60s yeah. kid, you know, and, and the Vietnam War was going on, and we marched, you know? That's what we did. That's what was available, you know? And we we had friends in the media, and we'd press there and so forth. but. Um, people just use whatever's available to them. That happened to be available and happened to work really well, but it was really easy to turn off. Um, the same was true with Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, you know, was, was this sort of radical other um, uh, television network, but it got shut off as well. And it's, you know, anything that's centralized like that, that's well understood and common, can be used. But then again, it's easy to turn off. So. I, I think if, if there's a need for a revolution and people are resourceful, they'll figure out ways to make stuff work. But that's, that in itself is a little bit simplistic because as we see with the Arab Spring, now that it's summer and fall and winter again in various places, um, it kind of it reads like Animal Farm over and over again, right? So that's, you know, 
complicated. It's complicated, but there's not a simple answer for that other than I think if we get the kind of technologies I'm talking about here, it'll be a lot easier for people to organize among themselves than it is to rely on these centralized services, which are not created for that purpose and aren't interested in it. I think there's a healthcare question from Jim. With HIPAA privacy laws more extensive today than ever before, might Credo be a potential solution for those that are dealing with private health information of individuals? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it will, and things like it. Um, uh, health is another one of those areas where it's a lot worse. Off, we're a lot worse off in the U.S. than in most of the rest of the world for various reasons. But. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, being able to communicate privately on that stuff matters. I think a bigger issue with health is that our health records are scattered everywhere and are not unified and not standardized. There's a huge incentivization um, at, for, with healthcare providers to only use um, siloed solutions. Every, every hospital has a siloed solution that they're using. They don't get along with the other hospitals. It's very complicated and very bad. So to me, that's sort of a bigger issue is incompatible systems. There, the, the numbers vary, but the number I've heard most often is about 250,000 people in the U.S. every year die of bad data. So um, HIPAA is an important thing, but that's a more important thing. Yeah. Uh, on your slide about the importance of the customer providing information to the manufacturer, and given that tech support is usually an imperfect process for most of us, and that Watson can run, uh, do a pretty good job at Jeopardy. Have you had any thoughts about uh, tech support being replaced by a Watson-like computer? I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, um, the weird thing about tech support is that in a lot of companies, they try to make people act like machines, right? Like, like right now, it, this, is, this is the convention. You call up the company, you actually get through to a human being, they say, Hi, I'm John, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, how are you? Thank you for asking, right? That's like the routine. You know, there's this new little ritual that you have to go through where they sort of have fake human contact. And then, you hear, and then you hear them reading from the script about whatever it is. Oh, your modem's down. Uh, have you turned off your computer and done this, that, and the other thing? Um, and, and that's wrong. So I, I don't know, it could be that a Watson can help there. Um, but I'm, I'm aggressively pessimistic about machines ever being human. Um, I don't think they ever will, and I don't, no matter how intelligent they get. Intelligence is not our, our most important faculty. I think empathy and you know, creativity, originality, learning constantly, changing over time, being weird, that's what makes us human, you know, and, and, and not how smart we are. Um, but I think that what I'm talking about here, which is uh, the ability of learning to move in both directions on any product you can name and having an easy way for that to happen so that a company making shoes or making wash machines or making cars or anything else can learn constantly. We can learn from them and having a conduit in which that can happen where we're in control of the valves is a really cool thing. Now what can be done on the corporate side to make that better is wide open. But I think having the agency and located on the individual side is the really important part of that. I just wanted to follow on to the here. lady's question on, on the Arab Spring and your comment on Turkey. Maybe I'll have to come back for four more talks, but it looks like in 15 to 20 years, between Facebook and Google and Musk, we will have a, not an independent internet, but two alternative internets flying yeah. around the globe. I mean, how does that affect, will these five things have to wait for that? Or? No, no, I think, those, I think these five things are gonna happen, they're gonna happen under different names and at different rates and in different ways where we're gonna to have to depend on the vicissitudes of nature, you know, or just whatever, whatever it is that, you know, whoever comes out with the cool thing first and best and, and it's gonna go sideways and all kinds of things are gonna happen. But in the meantime, we already have multiple internets. There, there, there are phones being sold in India right now that are just Facebook. They're your Facebook phone. That's an internet, you know. Today? Today? They block Netflix? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that, that, that'll make their customers real happy. <laughs> it's freaking stupid. I, I, I don't even know how to answer you know, what that even means. It's a big, dumb company acting a big, dumb way. It's not new. You know, it's just, uh, it just happens. Um, I mean, the thing is that 
anybody, anybody who has a control point where they can charge rents or make things hard for other people, and if they've got a bad soul, they'll do stuff like that. You know, but, but as for Netflix, Netflix is in an interesting and weird position because they, on the one hand, um, Reed Hastings says, well, you know, I'm all for net neutrality. At the same time, I'm going to pay or work out some deal with Comcast, so I get favored treatment of some sort. You know, it's, they're working it out. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not easy to live in this multi-central world at the same time that you know that there are virtues that favor independence and everybody getting a fair shot and everybody being a peer on this thing at the same time as you're doing that. It's very hard. I don't know if there's an easy answer, actually. But I think we'll have multiple nets. We already do, actually. Let's take one final answer, question from the audience and this, uh, let me this, wrap it up. Yeah. Do you think there are any valid limits on privacy, whether it be prosecution of criminals or terrorists or, you know, if Credo became so um, popular that it, most people had encrypted emails and, you know, would there be any role of the government or the private sector in at monitoring for some behavior and how could that be held accountable? You're, well, you're pushing toward an interesting, there's a lot of interesting questions there. It's sort of like, um, you know, everybody's going to have guns. You know, it's kind of what it's going to be like. Everybody's going to have a way to have to have complete privacy. How do they? What? What? If the government actually needs to know something about those people, how are they going to do it? Um, well, one is you can still subpoena it. There's all kinds of there are all kinds of you. You can have an encrypted communications channel, but at either end of it, there are going to be vulnerabilities or opennesses where they can come in and say, "We want you to reveal what you've got here." Um, but there's something that Clay Shirky, who's one of the teachers that I work with at NYU, and he's a pretty widely quoted guy, um, said it to a class where Joyce and I were sitting in uh, last year. It was a design class, and this <clears throat> one young woman said she wasn't going to present the idea that she had because she thought of all the bad ways it could be used. And Clay said, no, wait a minute. That's a sign that it's a good idea. You know, look at email. We would never start with the email we've got now if we were going to design it. You know, wait a minute, it's way too vulnerable. It's, it's open to spam. There's all bad kinds of ways it could be used. Same with the web, same with the internet itself. But the fact is that it's extremely handy. So it's, it's going to be a hard question to answer, you know, but we're going to have to work it out. Join me in yeah, giving him a round of applause. Thanks, Dave.